Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for joining, uh, both in the room and uh, online. Uh, welcome to this latest session of the SDL Law and Sustainability Global which is now being managed by the Sustainability Innovation and Law Circle here at SDL. Um, we're very fortunate uh, today to be able to host Professor Ronan Bong and to have this conversation about this land and development in, uh, in the Royal Sea in 2023, very much uh, shaping up this land map here in the further development of the Royal Sea with finalization of the text of this new international agreement on high seas biological diversity. Um, and indeed, we'll be hearing about an aspect of that. Um, Professor Ronan Long, of course, is one of the world's authority on the war of the sea, and particularly on the development of this new agreement. Professor Long is Professor at the World Maritime University, Director of the WMU Sasakawa Global Ocean Institute, which is an independent focal point working at the interdisciplinary interface between science, industry, policy, ocean governance, and law. Um, as, as mentioned, uh, Ronan is um, somebody who has had a long involvement in the development of this international agreement. Um, and certainly has a lot to share with us today. Uh, the title of today's lecture is Ocean Restoration and the BBNJ Agreement, uh, BBNJ being the universal shorthand uh, for the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Um, so, Ronan, you are very welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephen, and uh, I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, a very good evening uh, uh, to this audience. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to join you. And uh, China was a big um, actor in the BBNJ process. Uh, BBNJ, of course, is biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, right from the outset, may I add, uh, uh, over over 20 years ago, and I'd like to uh, come back to that. Now, the particular focus of my talk this evening is on, on ecosystem restoration and the BBNJ agreement. And uh, the reason why I'm focusing on this, I think, is because uh, there are certain important uh, global developments on which China has been very active in relation to ecosystem restoration. And I think this is uh, reflected in the BBNJ agreement. And of course, uh, there is a big uh, transnational dimension to this narrative. So I'm going to focus on uh, marine ecosystem restoration and the BBNJ agreement, but of course, I'll talk a little bit about the history of the agreement, as well as its architecture, and perhaps towards the end of the lecture, some substantive provisions. I have four questions really for the, uh, for the group that are attending uh, the talk this evening. Uh, firstly, what do we mean by marine ecosystem restoration? Uh, secondly, is there a normative basis uh, for marine ecosystem restoration in international and European Union law? And the reason why I've picked out the European Union is the uh, European Union was also a very important actor in the BBNJ process. And the European Union and China have been working on the issue of ocean restoration. And thirdly, I'll turn to the uh, Sino-European uh, transnational relations in the context of marine ecosystem restoration, not only in light of the developments of the new treaty, uh, the BBNJ agreement, but also within the, under the Convention on Biological Diversity with the uh, post-2020 biodiversity framework. And lastly, I'll turn to the issue of ec ecosystem restoration and how it features in the draft text of the BBNJ agreement. Uh, 
So four questions uh, to be addressed. I hope to have some, some time for questions and answers. I should ask, can everybody see my slides? Yes, no problem. Okay, this is good. Okay. Well, we, we, we can start with the, the part one of my lecture, which is uh, what, what do we mean by marine ecosystem restoration? Uh, secondly, the normative basis uh, for such a concept in international and in European Union law. And then, then thirdly, uh, how does it figure in transnational relations? And there I say, uh, transnational governance. And of course, that goes directly uh, to the interests of this particular group uh, uh, this evening. Uh, what do we mean by ecological restoration? And, and firstly, I would have to say, it is not a term of art. Uh, it has various scientific uh, policy and indeed uh, uh, legal meanings, which can uh, vary in different contexts. I'll, I'll give you two examples. Uh, society of Ecological Restoration, which is a big global scientific society, describes ecological restoration as a process of assisting the recovery of an ecosystem that has been uh, degraded, damaged, or destroyed. So quite a lot of emphasis there in that description on it being a process. And I'm going to come back to that later in my talk. And uh, the second part of this, I suppose, is that uh, what are you recovering to? And uh, there have been a number of scientific uh, papers on this issue. And it says it attempts to return a degraded ecosystem to its historical trajectory, which may be inferred from life history and functional attributes of dominant taxa. And that's taken from a, a scientific paper that I cite on the slide. So you're, you're trying to turn a degraded ecosystem back to its historical trajectory and so far, and so far as that is achievable or practical. Um, now, what we see uh, increasingly in the scientific reports, and I, I cite uh, three scientific processes and indeed reports here, is there is quite a strong empirical science base for restoration. And uh, it's something that's been called for in the uh, science reports ending, of course, the climate uh, uh, framework uh, instruments. And I would reference in particular the IPCC special report on oceans and the cryosphere and the ch changing climate. Uh, to 2019 reports and, uh, uh, you know, where it, it, there was a finding, right, that the uh, changes or human changes uh, and impacts on the uh, marine environment have impacted on marine ecosystems, and this is challenging their governance. Uh, likewise, uh, the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services the IPBS report 2019, and more recently, the fifth uh, edition of the Global Biodiversity Outlook, uh, which was uh, published uh, last year, refers to uh, the, the object of nature being conserved, restored, and used sustainably, while other global societal goals are simultaneously met through urgent and concerted uh, efforts fostering transformative change. Um, by the way, that finding is very consistent with what we're getting uh, from the special reports on a, on a changing climate. Now, more specifically in, in, in Europe, uh, there has been quite a lot of um, policy documents. I suppose a lot of these uh, crystallize into legal initiatives ultimately. And I would cite one of them, which is very important is the uh, European Environmental Agency's reports on the uh, state and outlook of the European environment, uh, where they call for a, an urgent need to mitigate pressures on the marine environment more rapidly and to restore ecosystems and uh, to support sustainability objectives. Uh, of course, the, 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 the three findings are just indicative. Uh, there are many, many references to ecosystem restoration and the World Ocean Assessment, uh, which has had uh, two editions, uh, one in uh, 2015, and of course, uh, 
and more recently in 2020, uh, the World Ocean Assessment. So you can take a look at those uh, perhaps in your, your own time. Uh, this list of scientific literature, of course, is not an, uh, an inclusive or an exclusive list. It's, it's a representative list to show you that the, the science and ecosystem restoration is evolving very, uh, very steadily and it is featuring in ocean science in, in particular. In, in terms of the, the, the push and pull factors, and uh, I looked at this uh, a number of years ago, and I've look, come back and look at it now, again, in light of, uh, of the uh, climate change, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and the response measures, as well, of course, more recently, uh, the draft text, the BBNJ agreement. And we can see that there are certain drivers uh, uh, we're seeing it both in the context of uh, policy documents, uh, such as the 2030 Biodiversity a Strategy, which I've cited, which mentions it as being a, a specific uh, goal of Europe's Green Deal. Uh, we see it in the environmental science and uh, some of the reports that I have cited. And we see a political dimension to this, and I'm going to get to that, and an economic dimension. And of course, it's reflected in the law and governance. In terms of outcomes, or what is this driving towards? And it's driving towards certain outcomes such as biodiversity maintenance and restoration. It is also driving towards uh, climate resilience. And that is hugely important because it, it really widens the narrative uh, for ecosystem restoration. And of course, by doing this, it will generate certain ecosystem goods and services, and they're, they're quite uh, crucial for the future of humanity. And uh, clearly, uh, there, there is a, 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 a blue dimension or a green economic dimension to ecosystems restorations. And there are many examples of that, both in China, uh, the European Union and elsewhere, and, and in terms of, for example, the recovery of uh, mangroves and uh, working with nature in the context of uh, building uh, climate resilience. Okay, so, so some examples there of the, the push and pull factors, uh, the drivers and outcomes. Now I'd like to turn to the kind of the law and the governance issues because it really sets the scene uh, for what we have in the BBNJ agreement. And uh, again, we see a very, very strong normative basis uh, for ecosystem uh, restoration, uh, both in uh, the Law of the Sea Convention and I cite uh, uh, particular provisions of the convention where uh, ecosystems restoration is implicit. Uh, I also cite uh, the 1994 implementation agreement, as well as provisions being developed under the uh, draft mining code and the environmental management and monitoring plan uh, for seabed mining. Again, we have specific re uh, references to the objective of restoration in the fish stocks agreement and a very important one in the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, which in Article 8 refers to the obligation to rehabilitate and restore degraded ecosystems and promote the recovery of threatened species. And then it gives uh, uh, inter alia amongst others and the development and implementation of plans and other management strategies. I'm going to come back to that because that's hugely important for China. Now it figures, um, quite highly in regional arrangements, and I cite a number, uh, including the OSPAR Convention, which applies here in the Atlantic and the Arctic, and indeed in the Kaminar uh, Convention, which has uh, a, a, an obligation on the restoration of depleted populations. I also uh, cite the Convention on Migratory Species, a very important international uh, instrument uh, where there is an obligation to restore migratory species to a favorable conservation status. Uh, I mentioned at the bottom of the slide the, the Paris Agreement, and uh, there is quite an emphasis on the carbon sinks. Uh, uh, but what we're seeing increasingly is uh, restoration of marine ecosystems and coastal ecosystems uh, features in uh, the NDCs uh, submitted by uh, parties to the Paris Agreement. Now, in terms of the jurisprudence, it, it features in both advisory uh, opinions of the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, both the Seabed Disputes 
uh, opinion, or the Seabed Disputes Chamber opinion, and uh, it noted right that restoration in the context of seabed mining will depend on actual damage and the technical feasibility of restoring the situation to the status quo. It also featured in the Sub-Regional Fisheries Commission advisory opinion. Uh, we've had very important jurisprudence in the context of compensation at the International uh, Court, uh, where the court found in Costa Rica versus Nicaragua, uh, the compensation uh, phase of the case uh, that active restoration measures may be required in order to return the environment to its prior condition, and so far that it is possible. Again, uh, this this is qualified uh, by its uh, the, the feasibility requirement. For instance, as well for in, uh, the the work of the uh, UN uh, Compensation Commission. I instance the draft articles on state responsibility, and we have uh, lots of practice around the world, including in the United States and, uh, and elsewhere. So the, the, the normative basis for restoration is very much instrument and context specific. I think there's a general uh, qualification, and we see uh, it's stated there both in the context of the ICJ jurisprudence and in the advisory jurisprudence of ECLAS around the concept of feasibility, and we can come back to that in the context of the, the BBNJ agreement later. In Europe, we have a very strong normative basis for doing a, a restoration. It's a requirement under the Habitats Directive. It's a requirement under the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. It features in marine spatial planning, and it also features in, in, in the regional seas conventions uh, which are very important in the context of the regional seas adjacent to Europe. Um, so I suppose, what are the problems? And again, the, the, the European biodiversity strategy uh, touches on this. Uh, that is to say, what are the problems given that we have quite a solid normative basis for doing this? Uh, firstly, uh, they point out there are major implementation and regulatory gaps. Uh, secondly, there are no binding targets or timelines, or indeed no definition or criteria and restoration. Uh, thirdly, there's no requirement to comprehensively map, monitor, or assess ecosystem services, health or restoration efforts. And, uh, and these are all exacerbated or indeed compounded uh, by gaps in implementation of the, the, the instruments that I have cited. Now, what's very, very important is the restoration and the commitment to ecological restoration has, has featured in the China EU a Blue Partnership uh, for the Oceans uh, Agreement, which was concluded in, in 2018. And here, the United, uh, the European Union and China committed uh, to the implementation of Goal 14 and to bring the BBNJ agreement uh, negotiations to a successful conclusion. It also committed uh, the two parties to working uh, together on a whole range of ocean issues, including on Arctic and Southern Ocean issues, and an agreement uh, in implementing the Paris Agreement on climate change to including obligations on the restoration of coastal ecosystems and an exchange of best practices. Now, uh, prior to the pandemic, the, the first Blue Partnership Forum between China and the European Union took place in, in Brussels in 2019, and stakeholders attending that forum uh, agreed to more direct investments uh, to sustainable oceans and uh, sectors and indeed to, to ecosystems restoration. So it features in the, 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 the political agenda uh, for transnational partnerships uh, between uh, Europe and China. Now, clearly, a restoration is very much uh, at the top end of the global biodiversity agenda. And the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework puts a major emphasis on restoration. And I will cite some examples of this. Uh, first and foremost, it figures in the the vision for 2050 and indeed the 2030 mission itself. Uh, on the vision for 2050, it's uh, by 2050, biodiversity is valued, conserved, 
and restored and, widely, and wisely used and maintaining ecosystem services, uh, the health of the planet and delivering benefits for all people. So restoration figures in the broader narrative. It all, also figures in, in goal A um, uh, in relation to what is to be achieved by 2050, as well as in, in goal B. And crucially important, it sets, uh, it, it, it sets down uh, within the framework uh, global targets to be achieved for 2030. And of course, I think possibly everybody in the room is familiar with some of these targets. One of which is by, believe it or not, by 2030, at least 30% of areas that are degraded, uh, by, including in the marine and coastal ecosystems, are under effective restoration in order to uh, enhance biodiversity and ecosystem functions and services. Uh, target four uh, speaks about urgent management actions to halt uh, human-induced extension of species, as well as the maintenance and restoration of genetic diversity. Uh, target 11 speaks about restoration and true nature-based solutions. And uh, elsewhere in section C of the framework, uh, which addresses the implementation of the framework. It explicitly references uh, the important roles and contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities as custodians of biodiversity and as partners in conservation and restoration. So I suppose in terms of the global targets, uh, firstly by 2030 and bearing in mind 2030 is uh, in biodiversity terms is just around the corner. Uh, we have very, very specific targets. And of course, we have to align this with the uh, what has been agreed in the draft text of the uh, BBNJ agreement. So turning to the BBNJ agreement, a little bit about its geographical scope, uh, a little bit about the negotiating process itself, and thirdly, uh, uh, the conclusion of the intergovernmental conference. Um, clearly, the, 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 the convention uh, itself has, and uh, I'm referring now to the Law of the Sea Convention or UNCLOS, has uh, a considerable number of provisions addressing areas beyond national jurisdiction, as well as provisions uh, which are very much uh, have to be aligned with the, the whole regulatory code uh, for areas beyond national jurisdiction. And I uh, highlight in the slide both the provisions in part uh, six on the continental shelf, because in many instances and in, uh, the continental shelf extends uh, out underneath the high seas, uh, provisions in part seven on the high seas, part 11 on the area, uh, 12 on the protection of the marine environment, 13 on marine scientific research, uh, uh, 14 on the development and transfer of marine technology, as well as uh, the provisions on binding dispute settlement in parts 15. Clearly, all of these provisions are germane uh, to the provisions that we have in the draft text of the BBNJ agreement. And my first point is, of course, this is the, the third implementation agreement. Uh, we have provisions in an agreement uh, on part 11, which was included in 1994. And we have provisions on the fish stocks, uh, straddling fish stocks and highly migratory fish stocks that is uh, in the fish stocks agreement uh, concluded a year later in 1995. So not only have you to read the, the BBNJ agreement in light of um, the provisions in its parent instrument, UNCLOS, but also in light of uh, the, the other two implementation agreements. Areas beyond national jurisdiction, for those that are not familiar with this term, refers to the, the high seas, as well as the international seabed area which we refer to as the area. Two thirds of the ocean is high seas. And uh, it's a significant uh, uh, part of the, the planet, uh, two thirds of the ocean. So, and this agreement will have, apply to two thirds of the ocean. <clears throat> the negotiating history of the new agreement, uh, very, very attenuated. Uh, goes back to uh, an ad hoc working group, uh, which met be between 2004 and 2015, and then moved on to a second phase, a preparatory committee, 
uh, for two years, 2016, 2017. <clears throat> and then thirdly, an intergovernmental conference, uh, uh, which by the way is, is suspended. It had to have its final, its final section, uh, session in the month of June this year, where they will do some uh, cleaning of the, the numbering of the, the text. So I suppose three different phases, an ad hoc working group, uh, which was, I suppose, a same scientific or technical group, preparatory uh, committee, which is a diplomatic phase, and then, of course, the intergovernmental conference, which is a lawmaking uh, body. And uh, uh, crucially, uh, the ad hoc working group met on, on, on nine occasions between 2006 and 2015. And in 2011, there was agreement that this uh, process would address uh, firstly the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, and in doing so, it, there would be four elements in the negotiation package. A marine genetic resources, including questions of sharing benefits. A secondly, measures such as area-based management tools, including a marine protected areas. A thirdly, environmental impact assessments. And fourthly, uh, the capacity building and the transfer of marine uh, technology. Essentially, they're the four uh, uh, core elements of the BBNJ agreement ever since. Uh, they featured not only in the work at the ad hoc working group, uh, but they also were uh, discussed and deliberated upon at the preparatory, uh, at the preparatory process. And of course, they formed the substance of the negotiations at the Intergovernmental Conference. Uh, the Intergovernmental Conference was uh, convened on foot of a, a, a General Assembly resolution, uh, which was adopted, believe it or not, on Christmas Eve 2017. And that resolution set down a commitment uh, uh, to develop an internationally legally binding instrument under the Law of the Sea Convention on the conservation, a sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, the process itself uh, was colored by uh, four considerations. Uh, firstly, uh, the development of a legally binding instrument. That was a very important step. Uh, initially, uh, way back at the ad hoc working group, there was no consensus on that. Uh, secondly, it was going to be a package deal uh, uh, following the methodologies that had been uh, previously used in law of the sea negotiations. And uh, uh, this package would uh, be agreed on, on the basis of consensus, uh, but provision also was made in the absence of consensus uh, for a vote, which could be carried by uh, two thirds of a majority of those present and voting. Uh, thirdly, uh, there would be one organizational meeting and four, four substantive meetings on the uh, four elements of the, the package, and that this whole process would be uh, finished by 2020. And fourthly, this whole process wouldn't undermine existing instruments or frameworks. Uh, they were the parameters, and uh, because of the pandemic, uh, there was a delay, and although the, the initial um, a uh, process started as scheduled in 2018. Uh, there was a first session in, uh, later that year, in September, a second session uh, uh, in, 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 in April, uh, March, April 2019. And on foot of that, uh, there was the development of a, a, what we refer to as the zero text for the negotiations, uh, which was read for the first time at the third session in 2019, there was a break uh, because of the pandemic. Uh, then there was a limited uh, attendance fourth session in March 22, a, a fifth session in August of last year, and then a resumed fifth session this year uh, where we had uh, agreement on the uh, substantive uh, provisions and text of the, the draft agreement. Uh, there will be a resumed session uh, uh, later, uh, uh, later this year in June, actually, uh, where they will do some cleaning on the numbering of the text. But the text is is agreed, and uh, I will walk you through it uh, in a minute. Uh, I think this this process was very important in in terms of uh, multilateralism and transnational governance. 
Uh, as I mentioned, the third implementation agreement uh, took close to, and indeed over 20 years, if we go back to its genesis, uh, before we had a, a conclusion of a, of, of a text. And throughout this process, I suppose the world changed dramatically, both the context of biodiversity obligations, ecosystem obligations, the, the, the pandemic, and indeed the, the whole progressive evolution of the, the climate change regime. And the, the, the last session of the, the BBNJ was very interesting because um, many of the compromises were negotiated in the last 36 hours. And uh, a very important issues uh, were addressed at, uh, uh, behind closed doors. And, uh, and there was very little time and none in some instances uh, to, review, to review it or formally adopt it uh, in the plenary. And uh, currently the IGC has a, an open-ended informal working group uh, undertaking technical edits uh, to ensure uniformity of the text and to harmonize it in all six languages, including in, in Chinese, of course, an official language of the UN. And um, this, will, uh, this working group uh, will resume the IGC in, in, in June 23 uh, to complete that uh, 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 technical edits of, of the text. Okay, so briefly, what have we in the, in the text? Uh, firstly, uh, we have a, a preamble, uh, quite a broad preamble, uh, references to uh, resilience, ecosystems, the climate, oceans, acidification. Uh, we have uh, general provisions, use of terms, very important number of terms. Uh, objectives are set out, and I'll return to this, at scope of application. Uh, uh, provisions on principles and approaches, and I will come back to this, and a very fundamental provision on international cooperation. A big substantive part, part two on marine genetic resources, sets out, including fair and equitable sharing of benefits, sets out objectives, application, activities with respect to MGRs, and notification processes, and then uh, the requirements in relation to fair and equitable sharing of benefits, as well as um, the establishment of a, a new body in access and benefit sharing uh, committee. Part three addresses area-based management tools, including uh, marine protected areas, and uh, has very elaborate provisions on objectives, area of applications, proposals, publicity, a consultation and assessment of proposals, the establishment of area-based management tools, or provisions on decision-making, emergency measures, implementations, as well as monitoring and review. Very technical and prescriptive part to the uh, draft text is on environmental impact assessment, on objectives, the obligations to conduct EIA, uh, the relationships between this agreement and other EIA processes, uh, thresholds and factors for EIA, uh, the process for EIA, a uh, decision making, a uh, monitoring, a uh, reporting, and of course review, as well as uh, 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 provisions addressing the work of uh, the scientific and technical body, uh, which is one of the new bodies established under the agreement. Uh, capacity building, six very important provisions on uh, objectives. A cooperation, modalities for capacity building, and types of capacity building, uh, monitoring and review, and the establishment of a new body, a, a, a capacity building and transfer of marine technology committee. Institutional arrangements are addressed in part six. Uh, new institutions, uh, including a, a mechanism, a conference of the party, a scientific and technical body, a secretariat, and a clearinghouse mechanism. Uh, extensive provisions on funding and uh, importantly provisions on implementation and compliance, and I'll come back to this, as well as provisions on dispute settlement uh, that um, uh, reflect in the main what we have in part 15 of the convention. Hugely important, uh, we also have advisory uh, uh, jurisprudence or advisory opinion uh, provisions uh, 
I was uh, delighted to see China supported that. Uh, provisions of part 10 on non part fees to the agreement, good faith and abuse of rights, uh, and, and Article 57. Article 58 through to 70, final provisions, uh, usually what we get in international agreements. All right. Uh, okay, what would I say about the agreement? Uh, incredibly prescriptive, very, very elaborate. I have a copy here in my office every day. I see uh, new elements in it. Uh, two annexes, one on uh, ABMTs and another on types of capacity building. It runs to 54 pages, and uh, uh, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, 70, 70 provisions, uh, a very comprehensive and complex uh, regime. Now I'd like to turn next to the last point, uh, or part of my talk uh, this evening, which is on restoration and the draft agreement. All right. Given the importance of this within CBD, we have targets set under CBD for the 2030 targets. We have a 2050 vision, but we see restoration features in a lot of international instruments. We see uh, China is working with the European Union amongst others on ecosystem restoration. We have specific provisions on restoration in four uh, uh, direct places in the agreement. Firstly, in the principles and approaches. Uh, secondly, on the provisions on area-based management tools. Uh, thirdly, in the provisions on funding. And fourthly, uh, the provisions on indigenous peoples. And that's quite nice. And I'll come back to that, the indigenous peoples role in terms of conservation and restoration. In terms of the, the principles and approaches, uh, I've divided it into three strands, uh, principles, approaches, and then the issue of the utilizing traditional knowledge in special circumstances. These are all set out in Article 5. Uh, for instance, and it mentions polluter pays principle, common heritage of mankind, freedom of scientific research, equity, precautionary principle or precautionary approaches approach, as appropriate, and the use of best available science and scientific information. Uh, crucially, in terms of approaches, it means ecosystems approach, uh, integrated approach, a, an approach that builds oh, ecosystems resilience, including to the adverse effects of climate change, ocean acidification, and maintains and restores ecosystems integrity, including the, the carbon cycling services that underpin the ocean's role in climate. So we see a strong <clears throat> nexus uh, between the climate regime and the ocean's regime around this thematic area or, or this uh, a concept of restoration. And we also see a, a, a role for the uh, indigenous peoples. Uh, we also see acknowledgement of the special circumstances of small island developing states and least developed countries as well as uh, landlocked uh, developing countries. Um, pretty robust, I think, in terms of principles and approaches, as well as uh, widening the, 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 the stakeholder group for, for decision-making. In, in relation to the objectives and funding, uh, and the objectives for area-based management tools, there is a very specific reference to restoration in the context of strengthening resilience to climate change, ocean acidification, and marine pollution. And that has to be welcome. We also uh, see a reference to the Global Environmental Facility Trust Fund, and we'd like to thank Stephen uh, for his support that he provided to negotiators in terms of the financing of capacity building and the uh, financing of this agreement. Uh, and there is provision there that the Conference of the Parties may consider the possibility of additional funds, including to finance rehabilitation or ecological restoration. And we have very specific uh, provisions on Indigenous peoples. I flagged some of those provisions on the slide, uh, that they would have an active say in the restoration uh, decision-making processes. And, uh, the institutional arrangements are quite uh, sophisticated. And there's going to be a conference of the parties, and uh, there's going to be a secretariat uh, 
uh, to support the work of these institutions. And then some of the subsidiary bodies is a scientific and technical body, which is an advisory role. Uh, there's going to be a clearinghouse mechanism, which is going to be very, very crucial uh, for the functioning of this instrument. Uh, there's going to be a financial and resources uh, mechanism. And then there are subsidiary bodies like a capacity building and technology transfer committee, uh, a, 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 an ABS committee for the sharing of benefits, and an implementation and compliance committee. So overall, a very sophisticated and, dare I say it, a very new architecture uh, for ocean, uh, ocean related uh, decision making on conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity of areas beyond natural jurisdiction. And <clears throat> I suppose a question we can ask the group is, uh, will this instrument mainstream ecological restoration into conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity? And of course, I think the jury is out on that. It will very much depend how these institutions operationalize ecosystem-based management. Uh, what measures are taken in relation to area-based management tools, including a marine protective area, especially since it'll have to cooperate and coordinate with all these sectoral bodies, as such as my own parent organization, uh, the International Maritime Organization. Will restoration figure in an environmental impact assessment or a strategic assessment uh, how will it feature in capacity building and technology transfer? There are no specific uh, substantive provisions on liability in this agreement. And liability is one of the big factors that drives restoration policies. And we saw that in the Macondo Prospect um, pollution incident in the Gulf of Mexico, that there was obligations to restore the ecosystem. A lot, of course, will, will depend in due course in terms of implementation and compliance and how that is being uh, overseen and, uh, by the implementation and compliance committee. In conclusion, I think um, <clears throat> if I reflect back on the uh, negotiating process, I think it changed between the, the pre and post pandemic uh, periods. I, I, I think certainly after the, the pandemic, there was a much greater emphasis on working within uh, nature. I think also at the publications such as the Europe's Green Deal, uh, the EU's 2030 biodiversity strategy, uh, the tendency across the world to focus on targets uh, uh, on ecosystem restoration under the 2030 agenda and on fisheries targets 14.2 and 14.4, gold 14. Um, fed into this process, and we, we, we see this reflected in the text. I think, um, <clears throat> irrespective of this text, we have quite a lot of substantive law, uh, uh, but the, the, the real issue is, you know, how do you implement restoration under existing laws and policies? And how, how do you realize these policy visions, uh, such as the one agreed under the, the CBD just before at Christmas on which China was so active. Likewise, I think uh, it's very important as to how Europe and China operationalize their commitment towards marine ecosystem uh, restoration. And of course, uh, we have a very specific target on this. 30% uh, of areas uh, that are degraded are going to be uh, under effective restoration by 2030. That is just you know, I, I don't know if that's uh, attainable or feasible uh, in, in, in just over six years time. And um, what I think is right, that we do have a good uh, basis for ecological restoration and cooperation, including uh, between the European and China in relation to the multilateral framework. And I would hope that both entities would, would become party to the, the agreement in due course because this agreement uh, is now closely aligned with the uh, 2020 Global Biodiversity Framework. Um, that concludes my talk. Uh, we've been working on this issue for a number of years, amongst other issues. Uh, so I'll be very, very happy to uh, 
to share the publications. They're all open access. And uh, I'm happy to take some questions now. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen, and to the audience uh, for bearing with me. It's uh, perhaps quite a lot to take in on a, on a Friday evening. It's a beautiful Friday morning here in Malmö, Sweden. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Bernie. We're very grateful to you. And um, really not just uh, putting restoration in the context of the world scene, the convention, but also the broader nuclear context in international environmental law and recent developments in, in biodiversity in particular. So I think uh, there's a lot there uh, to unpack and uh, uh, a lot uh, to be also getting on with in terms of implementation development of this in practice. Uh, but we do have some time now for questions. Um, so uh, let me just, uh, with the disclaimer that uh, we are recording this session, and as with previous sessions, we do hope that technology allowing to, uh, to publish the recording. So if you wish to um, make a question, you'll be in the recording, but the floor is open. Uh, perhaps those in the room, if anyone would like to ask a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, so my, my question is, we have seen the whole process of where, like, like where, when we have started a ne negotiation of this um, regime, actually we started in a early time. So my question is what makes uh, this treaty uh, so 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 hard to 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 be uh, 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 like negotiated and what well, what is the main arguments during the whole process? Like what are uh, the worries uh, each parties uh, are worrying about? The main, like, uh, of course, I I consider to name a few. For example, the, those um, uh, like small island that the developing uh, uh, countries they, they don't have the ability to to have those um, uh, scientific research in of the marine. So they they might not agree on like those kind of uh, benefit sharing um, for those developed countries because they are afraid uh, they don't have, you know, they, they cannot benefit from this kind of regime. That, that is basically the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brendan, uh, would you like to have a go at that question and we'll see if there are Yeah, others. look, it's uh, uh, two fantastic questions. And, uh, um, on the first question, which, you know, why did it take so long? I think this is hugely important um, for us as a global community and indeed the great scholars that are there with you this afternoon or this evening is that multilateralism, there, there isn't a huge degree of support within the global uh, community for big framework multilateral instruments uh, for the law of the sea. All right, uh, so we had two implementation agreements in the 1990s. All right, so I think the appetite for this uh, wasn't there at the start. And I, I, I can compare and contrast that to, for example, the, the, the 94 implementation agreement for seabed mining had to be concluded and adopted and brought into force and very fast in terms. Of, otherwise, the, the, the Law of the Sea Convention wouldn't have any, 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 any developed states' parties to it. You know, 17, there was four votes against, including the United States, and 17 abstentions in relation to the Law of the Sea uh, uh, Convention, as well as, well as many, many other. Uh, developed states which didn't uh, sign up or ratify the convention, so it became uh, it became apparent by 1994 that this 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 wouldn't function as a universal and global instrument. So they had to renegotiate at the behest of the United States, may I add, and Part 11. And of course, uh, the United States has never become uh, 
a party to the convention ever since. Um, Fishstock's agreement in 95 was also driven mainly by state practice. So we had unilateralism. And uh, so we had the specter of state practice overtaking developments in, 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 in treaty law. And uh, so we had Canada, the, the tension of the SI, but we had practice in Latin America as well, where there was a, a, a great belief amongst coastal states across the world that uh, the regulatory regime for straddling and migratory fish stocks wasn't sufficiently uh, robust enough uh, to meet the interests of sustainability and conservation. In the context of BBNJ, there wasn't any of those dynamics at play. So, the, the, you know, the ad hoc working group was very much focused on technical issues. It really didn't become a political issue until, until the convening of the, the, of the preparatory committee. And, uh, and then, it, you know, there wasn't a reading of the text, the zero draft, believe it or not, the negotiations only started at the third session at the intergovernmental, uh, at the intergovernmental process. Now, the, a big reason for that was the absence of consensus. And uh, consensus is such a difficult issue in multilateral processes uh, to bring everybody in the room uh, through this process uh, that everybody uh, would remain party to it. What I would say, and I have to say it to this audience, is China played a very important role in that. And that certainly after uh, the, the success uh, China had in, in, in the COP process, uh, China was very much committed, I think, to the, to the negotiation of this instrument, the final session of the BBNJ agreement, and was willing and was willing to conclude a, 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 a text which um, had every had very complex provisions which had to address a whole range of issues. So that's what I would say I, in relation to your, your first question. Consensus process lacked the political dynamic uh, for a long time. A lot of it was driven by uh, ENGOs, uh, uh, civil society stakeholders, and some champion states like Costa Rica. A European Union was very supportive of this instrument. Uh, that is Europe, but I, I, can't, I can't say the same about European Union member states. So th there had to be a lot of coordination done internally in Europe in relation to this agreement. Now, turning to, your, um, turning to your second question, of course, is uh, part of the difficulty was shall we say, the ideological uh, differences on, on marine genetic resources, whether it should be a high seas freedom or whether it should be a, a common heritage of mankind. All right, this was a conundrum uh, which has plagued this process since its inception. All right, then there was issues dealing with marine digital SQL information and the sharing of that. So uh, the key aspect of this, and of course there would be, have been no agreement unless there was going to be uh, very extensive provisions for a fair and equitable sharing of benefits. And, uh, and then that, the, that these provisions would provide for the building and development of the capacity of parties, uh, particularly developing state parties and uh, that there would be revisions on the development and transfer of marine technology. We worked quite a lot with Stephen on that and in terms of this. Um, one of the issues which was quite complex here was should fish be in or out? And uh, very different, um, uh, very different uh, views on this, very polarized and uh, the texts uh, has provisions on this, and the, the provision uh, states that fish and other leaving marine resources uh, will not come within the scope of this provision if they're taking in fishing or fishing related activities. However, if they're taken in, 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 in other activities relating to uh, the utilization of them for marine genetic resources, then they will fall under the scope of this scope of this agreement. So that was very important. And uh, the provisions on, 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 on um, 
undertaking scientific research in relation to marine uh, genetic resources are, are quite elaborate and quite sophisticated. And crucially, they provide for both non-monetary benefits and monetary benefits. And a key aspect of non-monetary benefits is capacity building, as well as the transfer of marine technology. And uh, the precise modalities for this have yet to be agreed, and they will be agreed by the conference of the parties. Uh, but what is important is there's going to be a new committee, an access and benefit sharing committee, the ABS uh, committee, who will develop guidelines uh, or a code of conduct. So that was important. And then there's going to be a monitoring mechanism and a clearinghouse mechanism and uh, for, for tracking, uh, tracking the utilization of MGRs. And uh, I think it's a compromise on MGRs. Uh, there's no track and trace, uh, but it's a workable system. Uh, the focus is on uh, conservation and capacity building. I suppose a unique part of this is any of the benefits are going to be used for the implementation of the, the agreement and for conservation purposes. The whole thing is dependent on, on the adoption of national laws and policies. And uh, there's no reference to uh, IPR in the draft text. And a lot is contingent on this new institutional arrangements and how, how, how these new subsidiary bodies are going to function and work with the COP, as well as how the, these institutions will work with other international bodies. So, uh, then I, you know, there's a lot, a lot to be worked on yet. But we do have the framework and we do have the institutions. And so I hope that that addresses your two questions, why it took so long and the issue of benefit sharing. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks a lot, uh, Rene. Uh, those of us who are joining virtually, do you have any questions? This, this is the time. Anyone who's joining online via Zoom has a question for us. I don't see any requests for the floor. So perhaps I could ask you, one of the um, interesting things about the financial mechanism is that uh, in respect of the GEF and the special fund, it, it specifically provides that it can support um, the work of indigenous peoples and local communities uh, using their traditional knowledge. So I wonder if you might say something about the potential of the Indigenous people contribute to some marine preservation. Sorry, we're on mute. Okay, thank you very much, Stephen. I do apologize. Uh, I didn't hear your question very well, but I think uh, I can speak to indigenous peoples and the financial mechanism, yeah? And uh, look, there, there was great support towards the end of this process that indigenous peoples knowledge and local communities knowledge would feature in the agreement. And there is a reference to the declaration on the rights of indigenous peoples in the uh, preamble to the agreement. And that perhaps sets the context and the framework. And uh, I suppose, right, crucially, uh, their, their knowledge uh, is, 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 is informing the principles and approaches to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Now, what's important in this context is the uh, the, the, shall we say the, the moving parts of the agreement are the operational parts and uh, we have a very very specific uh, provision on this in article 10 and that really came out of well, what the Pacific Islanders wanted uh, what Australia of course has uh, very important uh, indigenous peoples as well as New Zealand with the Maoris uh, First Nations in Canada and, and, and towards the end of negotiations, uh, United States supported this, these provisions. Uh, uh, firstly, that their knowledge in relation to MGRs 
will only be accessed on the basis of uh, their free prior and informed consent or approval. So this is the, 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 the formulation, uh, as well as their involvement. And uh, <clears throat> access to such traditional knowledge may, may be facilitated by the clearinghouse mechanism. So that, that will operationalize it. Now, what's important in this context is, right, not only is it in the principle and approaches, as I've said, uh, we, we do have this general clause, but it also is reflected in the, the operational provisions on area-based management tools, including on emergency provisions, which could be very important for small island developing states, uh, where they need something specifically to be done in the context of a natural or human-induced phenomenon. Uh, we have them in the EIA provisions, the capacity building, and we have a specific reference both, as you've mentioned, and the funding mechanisms and the, the scientific and technical, the technical body. I had a look at it again this morning, and um, I mentioned it on my slides, right, is that the funding mechanism is a lot of it is going to dis, de, de, depend on the decisions of the conference of the parties. So um, it's 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 very much appears to be uh, dare I say it a cafeteria of options. So uh, they 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 wanted to, to to widen the scope for a a. A, a, in Article 52 to have something far more uh, comprehensive uh, in terms of funding arrangements, uh, uh, not only in the context of the special fund and, and the Jeff uh, Trust Fund, uh, but also a fund for capacity building projects. And I think that's going to be crucially important in the context of, uh, in, in the context of the operationalization legitimacy and the buying in of uh, small island developing states, as well as indigenous and local communities to support this instrument. But if their views are not being taken on board, and uh, if they're not being supported in terms of uh, participation, uh, then this, this, this instrument won't function in that level. And uh, the, the reason why I mentioned this, uh, Stephen, is this instrument requires 60 ratifications. And, uh, and this instrument is not going to be like the Paris Agreement, where one year later, we're going to have universal support. And uh, we know this from, say, port state measures. Uh, I think that is, uh, it might be up there around 65, right? I'd have to check. But certainly the compliance agreement, high seas compliance agreement, I was around when that was negotiated in 96. I think that only has 47 parties. And, uh, and it's one of three instruments uh, pertaining to fisheries on the high seas. So there, there wasn't a buy-in for the compliance agreement. So we, without funding mechanism uh, and the financial resource provisions in Article uh, 52, providing the oil uh, to, to make the engine run, I don't think that the engine is going to start or run very well. And, you know, we, we, we spoke to you and we got a lot of advice from your experience as to how to make this a more uh, uh, realistic proposition in terms of its operationalization or in terms of uh, decision-making bodies. Because if, if, if you, uh, certainly if a state party can participate in, in the various subsidiary bodies, uh, then there will be uh, the decision-making processes or indeed it's not deriving the kind of funding it needs for ecological restoration or the, uh, uh, conservation of uh, biodiversity, th then I don't think it'll have the, the buy-in that's going to be required uh, for the 60, the 60 and more ratifications. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that would be a major concern for, for me. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah, so look, time, time will see how, how, how this, how, how, shall we say, the, the appetite on the positive side, I don't know what it was like in China. Uh, and, and by the way, the Chinese delegation was fantastic. And this agreement wouldn't have been achieved, or the agreed text wouldn't have been achieved unless China had a real commitment in terms of getting the deal done. And I, I think it had important issues. 
uh, that it needed to 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 coordinate with the, the other uh, other states in the negotiating process, other groups within the negotiating process. But it seemed to be able to resolve those issues, and it seemed to be committed not only to the, this new institutional setting, uh, but also the, the the whole nature of this agreement. So that was, I, for me, that was a very good day in terms of uh, bringing this process to a conclusion. Well, indeed, thank you very much, uh, Roman, and, and also for that note of realism. But of course, uh, this is the text at the moment. Hopefully, it will be adopted without incident. But then, of course, the process of ratification is is before us uh, before it can enter into force. Uh, but it is a, a, a stunningly significant agreement, and I think we've just heard from you why it is so important, why it's so important that it does enter into force. Um, so, so thank you very much, uh, Professor Roman Long, for joining us today. And thank you to everyone who's joined, either in the room um, or online. So, thanks again, everybody, and I wish you all the best for the remainder of your day. Take care. Great to see everybody, and thank you, Stephen. Uh, very happy. Thanks, John. You're you're wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. <laughs>